A short time ago, I made a video outlining my thoughts and concerns about Doctor Who's upcoming 60th anniversary specials. Now, it turns out I had a lot more to say than I thought I did, and while it was good to get all of that off my chest in the hope of exercising some demons so that I can get on with simply looking forward to brand new Doctor Who, and brand new Doctor Who going big for its Diamond Jubilee at that, it seems that not all of those concerns have entirely dissipated. In fact, none of them have. So, as a distraction, I thought, why not rank the anniversaries of Doctor Who past? Rather than going all out and including documentaries and retrospectives, because if I'm honest with you, 30 years in the TARDIS would probably come out on top. Rather than do that, I've decided to stick to anniversary specials which purely take place within universe, in story. So that's uh, TV specials, Big Finish audios, uh, a novel and a webcast. Now, there was a novel released in November 2003 which naturally coincided with the 40th anniversary called Deadly Reunion written by Barry Letts and Terence Dix featuring the third Doctor, Joe and Unit. But firstly, the date of its release seems to be the only thing marking it out as an anniversary special. And secondly, I ain't read it, so I uh, won't be including it in this list. The ones I can and will be including are as follows. 10th anniversary, The Three Doctors. Technically closer to the 9th anniversary, it has come to be regarded as the celebration of the 10th. It opened the 10th season of the show and very obviously has retrospective vibes by bringing back Hartnell and Troughton. 20th anniversary. The Five Doctors, arguably Doctor Who's biggest birthday bash so far. 25th anniversary, Silver Nemesis. Possibly a stretch to include this one, but the title, combined with when in the show's history this went out, does suggest this was sort of packaged as the 25th anniversary. Sure, Remembrance of the Daleks, which kicked off the same season, might be a more fitting birthday party. I've just never thought of it as the Silver Jubilee, whereas this one feels like it's definitely presented that way. 30th anniversary, Dimensions in Time. We can argue about canon another time. Well, I say we, you can. I'm not too bothered when it comes to this, mainly because I genuinely absolutely cannot bring myself to include it as such, making any debate about it redundant. Besides, there's definitely some other entries coming up which have dubious canonical status. But there's no denying, Dimensions in Time did mark the 30th anniversary of Doctor Who. 35th anniversary, The Infinity Doctors, one of those entries with dubious canonical status. A novel from the BBC Past Doctor's Line written by Lance Parkin, deliberately featuring a nebulous incarnation of the Doctor and delving into backstory and Time Lord lore. This was outlined as a way of marking the 35th anniversary, even says so on the back cover look. 40th anniversary, Scream of the Shalker. Perhaps another stretch as celebrating the and produced to coincide with the aren't necessarily the same thing, but this was new Doctor Who around the 40th anniversary. Sure, New Doctor Who then negated by the big announcement that there'd be new New Doctor Who very soon in the form of a triumphant return to television. And this also wasn't the only 40th anniversary either. Zagreus. A huge three-part epic from Big Finish featuring Peter Davison, Colin Baker, Sylvester McCoy, Paul McGann and even a posthumous John Pertwee alongside a plethora of former companions, mostly all of them in very different roles. A hugely divisive story, so where will it sit in this ranking? 45th Anniversary, 45. A rather on-the-nose title for four interlinked half-hour audio episodes featuring the 7th Doctor Ace and Big Finish original companion, Hex. It released on the 45th anniversary and is called 45. It counts. 50th Anniversary, The Light at the End. Big Finish's contribution to the Golden Jubilee, but by this point, Doctor Who was back on TV proper, unlike the 30th and 40th anniversaries, which means there's another entry for the 50th anniversary as well. The Day of the Doctor. If you wince slightly at me saying the Five Doctors is arguably Doctor Who's biggest birthday bash so far, then it's likely because you'd consider this one to be. And there's definitely a case to be made for both. Now, it should be pointed out that while I will obviously be ranking these in terms of how good a story they are, there are other considerations. Namely, does it do a good job as an anniversary celebration of Doctor Who? And obviously, some anniversaries have more limitations than others. As I already said, Doctor Who wasn't on TV for the 30th and the 40th anniversaries. And it can't be argued that a 50th anniversary is a far bigger birthday to celebrate than a 45th. So the Day of the Doctor is a very different kettle of fish from 45. 
So this is not exclusively a worst to best list in terms of story quality alone because there are other criteria to think about. Which means that as my main Doctor Who marathon goes on, these may not be ranked the same relative to each other. And there'll also be cursory appraisals because full ones I'll be saving for their turn to come on the marathon. Although I have gone a little bit deeper in some of the expanded universe stuff because they're not going to feature on the marathon. So, with all that being said, let's get into it. This has its defenders, but nah, I'm not one of them. Even though I was absolutely its prime audience. Nine years old, had fallen in love with the show a few years before, and here was a new episode for the first time in half my life. Except even as a kid, I couldn't particularly get on board with it. Much was made of the 3D gimmick, but it didn't quite come off. I mean, obviously it didn't come off, what were they thinking? But as a kid, it felt like I'd been promised the moon and been given a football. It was a huge letdown. Watching it as an adult is an even less edifying experience. The frenetic pace with which it moves, combined with the doctor spotting, I guess as a kid was something to hang on to, but now the mess is all just there to behold with nothing to hide behind. Disorienting enough to be nauseating. The crossover with EastEnders is another layer on the whole thing which just adds to the pervading madness. That said, if I'm feeling generous towards Dimensions in Time, which is rare, then I'd have to say that judging it as a new episode of Doctor Who is sort of unfair. It isn't, not really. It's a fundraising exercise uh, for children in need while also happening to mark the 30th anniversary and roping the cast of EastEnders in for a bit of fun. It has very little budget, it has very limited screen time. It can't be too deep or involved a proposition and it probably has more identifying features than any other 13 minute stretch of Doctor Who. Seriously, it's two parts, one seven and a half minutes, the other five and a half minutes, and it's the one with Albert Square, floating Hartnell Troughton heads, Madam What Year Is This, the sixth Doctor meeting the Brigadier for the only time on television, the phone-in vote as to whether Mandy or Big Ron would save the Doctor, Romana meeting Grant and Phil in the Arches, Tom's Mayday Mayday urgent message for all of the Doctors, and loads, loads more. It's basically like nothing else in all of Doctor Who. It's also up there among the Doctor Who stories with the most viewers, so, you know... Actually, I don't know, it's the pits. I know it's for a good cause and everything, it should be applauded for being a slice of new Doctor Who while fans were going through a drought, but even all that considered, I can't consider it any good. Do seek it out though if you haven't already, if only just for the curiosity factor. Okay, cards on the table, this isn't just one of my least favourite stories when it comes to anniversaries, it's one of my least favourite stories full stop. Officially the 25th anniversary story, despite there being a stronger contender for that accolade, it has almost exactly the same plot as that far better story, and having Ace say as much doesn't exactly excuse it. There is something very unsettling and therefore a rare success for me in terms of this story in having present day Nazis. Like actual present day Nazis, people living in the contemporary present who still believe in the Reich, rather than Nazis transported forwards in time or whatever. But the squander of that promise is probably one of the story's biggest crimes and is one of the main reasons why I can't get on with this story. The direction is pretty good with the Doctor and Ace ambushed and shot at before falling in the river, coming off quite well. It's got the very solid pairing of Sylvester and Sophie, one of my favourite TARDIS teams. Of course they are, they're my first, they're awesome. But this story very quickly unravels. Mostly because this story seems to progress like this. And then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and it gets old very quickly. A little like Dimensions in Time, this one has a relatively limited screen time. It's got three episodes, but it tries to put too much in them. It's got the Cybermen, it's got Lady Penfort, it's got the Nazis wanting to start the Fourth Reich, and then, even then, more superfluous stuff is just added to the mix. Piled on and piled on and piled on. Ugh. The cameo from the Queen, not the real Queen, and the late 1980s thugs don't go anywhere and they don't add anything and if you're already struggling to make the plot and the subplot count for anything, then adding all of this stuff on isn't just misguided, it's aggravating. In fact, this story tries to do so much that it ends up just coming out like white noise and I actually think one of the Cybermen sums it up really well at one point. Is this the human condition of madness, leader? So, as a story, I think it's a mess, but as an anniversary special, it's also considerably lacking. Now, I know that five years before, it wasn't that long before that fans had the 20th anniversary of the Five Doctors and the Long Leap blowout and all of that, so maybe this one didn't need to go as big or as hard as that. It's just that 
a silver jubilee, 25 years, is a big important milestone. And as anniversary specials go, while this is considered to be the closest we're going to get to a 25th anniversary special, there's a much better one, like I said, at the beginning of this season. Remembrance of the Daleks. The Day of the Doctor rubbed some people up the wrong way in the build-up and in the event itself. And it's something I have to remember when I keep feeling nervous and uneasy about the 60th. Some thought the Day of the Doctor served only to celebrate New Who. Some even went so far as to call it an 8th anniversary special. Thank goodness then for Big Finish, who those fans thought were doing it properly, getting the classic Doctors together when the TV special had callously omitted them. Thing is, the Light at the End is written by somebody who's not a bad writer by any means, but had been on record as saying he didn't really care for multi-Doctor stories. And that comes across in dialogue between the Doctors which feels flat and uninspired. I'm a sucker for multi-Doctor stories, which I promise you isn't the reason I'm worried about the 60th, so having uh, Tom, Peter, Colin, Sylvester and Paul all bantering together with a companion each and one of the best incarnations of the Master, Geoffrey Beavers, as a villain, it was all a very exciting prospect. Except the story acts like it thinks that that's enough and doesn't really try anything beyond that. If the light at the end proves anything, it's that having Doctors together does not make for a good story in and of itself. Tom Baker was taking full part in a multi-Doctor story for the first time ever, so that is a big deal. But it's not going to prop the story up all by itself. The Day of the Doctor has a plot, a story which engages, whereas Light at the End never really comes off autopilot. Some criticisms of multi-Doctor stories are precisely that, that they end up feeling more like excuses than stories, and I think that's a little short-sighted. I mean, it's accurate when it comes to this particular offering, but having a shopping list of Doctors and Companions doesn't necessarily need to stimmy a good story. The Day of the Doctor does a good job, and Terence Dix managed to pull together a very cohesive plot for the five Doctors. I just can't say it's done very well here. It's not a total buzzkill though, not by any means, because it's joyfully discombobulating hearing Tom Baker as the Doctor sharing scenes with Big Finish original companion Charlie Pollard. And each Doctor having one companion works really well because we end up with lovely little combinations and scenes like Perry and Ace meeting and comparing Doctors, Leela and Charlie doing the same, and my own personal favourite, the seventh Doctor meeting Perry again. Sylvester McCoy plays that quietly and beautifully. So what about the actual plot? Well, it takes a while to get going actually as we flip between Doctors and Companions and having the meeting and then start working out what's going on, which seems to revolve around a normal man in November 1963, 23rd if you're wondering, whose family have gone missing. And the Master's also involved. He's in the form of Geoffrey Beavers, who as I've said, I happen to think has proven himself as one of the very best Masters of all. And he's on fine form here too, dripping sophistication and menace in equal measure. We know roughly where each Doctor is in their timeline based on which companion they're travelling with, but the Master's placement here seems really odd, and that's a prevailing issue I've got with this script, so let me explain. He's from before the Keeper of Traken, he's still in the emaciated husk body, but he's yet to take up residence in the Melkor and cross paths with the Fourth Doctor, Adric and Tremas. And we know this because he hasn't met Nyssa yet. But my question is, why? Surely you'd save yourself a few precious lines of dialogue by having him be from afterwards. Nissa already knows the Master, so why wouldn't you have the Master also know Nissa? It's the most logical thing to do when timekeeping is a consideration, which it should be when you've got a crowded multi-Doctor mashup with a time limit. Nicholas Briggs has written some very good Doctor Who, so I find it really strange that he would do that to himself and make it harder by adding in extra dialogue that he doesn't need. And it's, it's not the only strange decision this story makes either. As if to highlight this story never really getting off autopilot setting, I think I counted about 20, maybe upwards of 20, old girls when the Doctors are referring to the TARDIS. Now, in a story that's two 60 minute episodes, that's a lot of old girls to be noticeable. I know it's only a little thing, but it kind of feels indicative of the approach taken with this story, which seems to be a half-hearted attempt to prove that an exercise that somebody has said is futile, multi-doctor story, is in fact futile. So no, I'm not keen on it as a production, but with the 50th anniversary being quite a biggie, and this being Tom Baker's first participation in a full cast multi-doctor story, the deflation is all the more pronounced.
We're still on the Big Finish train five years previously as we mark the 45th anniversary with a release from what was known at the time as the main range. No special releases, no big huge epic, just a regular release themed around the number 45. It's a Seventh Doctor release, and rather than being a standard four-part story, it's an anthology of four short one-parters. False Gods, Order of Simplicity, Casualties of War, and The Word Lord. And each contain one or more references to the number 45. So if that all sounds inconsequential, well then, yeah, I guess it is. Who makes a big deal at the 45th anniversary? It doesn't necessarily go big guns, but it does have a few things which edge it above the others so far. Sure, one of those is relative expectations, and because this doesn't have the pressure of marking a massive milestone, it doesn't really need to do much more than it does, but there are other positives in there as well. First of all, a consistent TARDIS team. Having the 7th Doctor, Ace, and Big Finish Original Companion, Hex, go through all four short tales offers some rigidity in the various settings, which really helps when the quality of those vary. Basically, there's no real way of rating 45 in this list without taking an average of these four short stories. False Gods has a nice premise behind it, and it even has a pre-fame Benedict Cumberbatch as Howard Carter. That, that premise is that some Time Lord students end up mistaken for and revered as Egyptian gods, and, it, and it's all just fine. Order of Simplicity is the weakest of the four, with a villain in the 34th century craving a return to natural simplicity, and so he's reducing the IQs of people to 45. It's all a bit... which means that half an hour passes by with very little to show for it. Casualties of War is better, with the trio finding themselves in London 1945, VE Day to be precise, and Ace, as in The Curse of Fenric, meets her young mother, now a couple of years older, since that season 26 adventure. It ties into an ongoing big finish thread with The Forge, a Black Ops-like organisation which recur through various Doctors, though mostly the Seventh. Better still, and the best of the bunch, is The Word Lord, who is an excellent Doctor Who villain, from a universe whose main form of physics is language rather than matter. This leads to some really imaginative scenarios, like The Word Lord disguising his ship as a joke to get in somewhere. As far as I know, the Word Lord has only returned once in another Seventh Doctor audio, but I'd buy any subsequent return in a heartbeat. So, all in all, a mixed bag, but it's at this position because it doesn't fumble the celebrating of its respective anniversary. It, in fact, ends up being quite a suitable celebration. And also, I might have sounded a bit disparaging about three of these stories, but the Word Lord is so good that it brings it up. November 1993 and we get new Doctor Who with Dimensions in Time. Great, thanks. Nine-year-old me is grateful, he guesses, but when, when's, it, when's it coming back properly? November 2003 and we get new Doctor Who with Scream of the Shalka. Great, thanks. As you can tell from its position on this list, 19-year-old me was far more grateful for Scream of the Shalka in 2003 than nine-year-old me was for Dimensions in Time in 1993. I actually had to go to my university campus's computer lab to uh, watch this every week when a new episode dropped and it was genuinely exciting. When this was announced it felt like it could be a future for the show. Because I guess by 2003 we'd all kind of grown accustomed to the fact that Doctor Who was dead. The movie hadn't led to anything so I think expectations were probably tempered in a way that they weren't in check when Dimensions in Time rolled around. Therefore, Scream of the Shalker was a lifeline. Richard E. Grant as the Doctor, Sophie Oconino as the companion Alison, Derek Jacobi as the Master. Yeah, the animation might have aged badly, even the method of broadcast became antiquated quite quickly. But at the time, this felt proper. As proper as we had got in a long, long time. Ultimately then, it was the perfect 40th anniversary present. New Doctor Who being taken far more seriously than 10 years previously. I do get a burst of nostalgia remembering those trips to the university library to watch this. I even decided one night not to go out and get student drunk with my friends because I had Schalke to watch. And maybe that's because I had been so starved of new Doctor Who and this felt like the closest we were ever going to get to it that maybe I embraced this a little bit too hard. And is that the reason why I like this as much as I do? Well, maybe, and I'm not going to lie that that nostalgia isn't a reason why this has this position on this list. It's just that every time I really visit it, I still think it's quite a good story. Paul Connell's script has limitations imposed on it in terms of format and timings, and it does creak under some of them, but on the whole it's actually pretty tight, and it's got some lines in there that are as good as anything from the show proper. It's been a long time since anyone screamed at me, and then I think they were only waiting for Elvis to come on. But my poetry went down tremendously. 
It's a fun six episodes, and each episode is about half the length of a classic series episode, so it uh, is about as long as a classic series three-parter. Uh, so it doesn't stay its welcome. Uh, but what I think I can point to, to show that it wasn't just Doctor Who's starvation that made me devour this and enjoy it as much as I did, is that I watched it knowing that Doctor Who was coming back to television. Not long before, they'd announced that Doctor Who was going to come back shepherded in by Russell T Davis. So while Scream of the Shulker felt like it could be the future of Doctor Who when it was announced, by the time it came around, we knew it wasn't. But it was lovely to have it nonetheless. For the 35th anniversary, it definitely says on the back cover look, the BBC past Doctor novel range offered up the Infinity Doctors, a cheeky title to fit in with the big anniversary naming convention, but one which bravely elects not to mention which Doctor takes part in this story, with vague descriptions as not to give anything away, and also sets it at a nebulous point in the Doctor's life. This could be a Doctor we know, but equally it could be a parallel timeline free from all the continuity that we've become entrenched in. I like to think of it as the latter. The Doctor has settled on Gallifrey. It's mentioned that he has travelled before, but he's most definitely returned and is now based on Gallifrey. Uh, he's still got a TARDIS of his own. Um, he teaches uh, at the Academy. He's got a student called Lana, who's just graduated to becoming a full-time Lord. Uh, he bones her. Scandal. There are a few other vague hints that the timeline is different from the Prime one. Uh, there's a character on Gallifrey with a pointed beard, known only as the Magistrate, who's the Doctor's oldest friend, and it's definitely coded as to be the Master without that being explicit. He uh, He's also settled on Gallifrey, so it's really nice seeing how their relationship might have developed had that been the case. It's actually a very liberating approach to Doctor Who, a completely different setup from what we're used to, which still ends up paying homage to the legacy of the show in a fresh and different way. There's Gallifrey lore, there's Time Lord backstory, but by, by being deliberately coy about its nature, like is it a big what if, or is it canon and is just letting the reader do the acrobatics to decide its place in it, it feels unique. There's nothing else like this in the whole Doctor Who oeuvre. Never saying oeuvre again. It's a nice word to say, but blimey, it's pretentious. It's also very well written by Parkin. The flashback to the origin of the Santarans as we know them is enough to engender sympathy, reframing this comical of monsters as something pathetic and pitiful. There's an insane Time Lord called Savar, who is genuinely one of my favourite ever Time Lord characters aside from the Doctor and the Master, and his situation is unique and terrifying. He was found insane with no eyes after having seen God. And there are still enough recognisably doctory traits within this very different Doctor as to feel like the same character. Uh, he at one point cheekily bends the laws of time so that he can be in two places at once to welcome both sides of a, a peace summit that he has arranged. And that peace summit is between the Santarans and the Rutans, which I think is a lovely little inclusion. It sort of resisting the urge to make this anniversary story a big Dalek one. And with this only being the 35th anniversary, I think it's wise to go different. Let's say, for argument's sake, that the novel range continued up until the 50th anniversary and Doctor Who never came back to television. And if this was the 50th anniversary story that the novel range chose, then yeah, it would probably be a little bit disappointing. But for its relatively small anniversary, it more than passes muster, in my opinion. And what we're talking about, in my opinion, uh, it doesn't, really doesn't matter where people choose to place this within the canon of Doctor Who. I myself choose to place it just outside. But apparently the writer himself has said otherwise in the past. Other readers have thought that this might be a younger First Doctor who uh, went off travelling and then returned to Gallifrey for a sustained period of time before eventually then running off again with his granddaughter. Others think that it's um, uh, the Eighth Doctor at a certain point in his life and all of those interpretations are valid if they work for you. I mean, hell, 20 years later, the Timeless Child came along and allowed this to then be a pre-Hartnell Doctor story, if you so wish. But for me, imagining it as an alternate timeline, an alternate Doctor, 
is just an exercise in enjoying the book more. Like if you think it's uh, if you think it's the eighth Doctor, you've got to explain away certain things. If you think it's the first Doctor, you've got to explain why he knows what Daleks are before he meets them. That sort of thing. If it's uh, an entirely different Doctor from an alternate timeline, you sort of negate the idea of having to do any mental acrobatics while you're reading it, and you can just get on and enjoy it. And I do enjoy it, as is probably evident. And it's the kind of story which lends itself very well to being told in prose. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Doctor Who novels. It always strikes me as a very odd way to tell a Doctor Who story. But there are some which make full use of their existence as a novel, rather than existing as just like a novelised TV pitch, which I do feel like some of the novels come across as. This one, being a novel is the best and most optimum way of telling this particular story. In fact, it's probably a stronger story than some of the ones on this list that I'm yet to get to, but this is a list of anniversary specials, so I have to take into account its anniversary specialiness, and in that area there are some that supersede it. But its quality as a story and its unique angle in celebrating a fairly inconsequential birthday are what elevate it above the others in this list. And I do recommend seeking it out. Alongside Scream of the Schalke, there was another 40th anniversary special, and this is easily one of the more ambitious. See, not only was Zagreus a 40th anniversary special, it was also going to pay off the enormous cliffhanger from the 8th Doctor's previous story, Neverland, after an agonisingly long wait. 18 months. And I keenly felt the anticipation, and not just that anticipation, the anticipation for a big birthday blower and for a multi-Doctor extravaganza, given that the faces of um, Davison, Colin, uh, McCoy and Paul McGann all graced the front cover with a cheeky little Pertwee on the inside of the CD case. Yet, Zagreus hasn't ended up being one of Doctor Who's most loved children, possibly because it has so much to live up to. This would be the first time that Paul McGann would be interacting with his predecessors, so it's no wonder that anticipation was as high as it was. Except. Zagreus doesn't give us a traditional multi-Doctor story, as was in keeping with Big Finish sort of like carving out its own ongoing era of Doctor Who at this point. Uh, Peter Davison, Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy, for the most part of the story, they don't actually play their Doctors, they're playing other... Well, they, they do, in a sense, but it's complicated. But they spend most of it ostensibly playing other characters. There are two brief scenes where the four Doctors actually interact as Doctors, but other than that, we have Davison playing Reverend Matthew Townsend, a clergyman from the 1950s with an interest in scientific progress. We've got Baker playing Lord Tepesh, a cardinal on Gallifrey during the time of Rassilon, who also happens to be a great vampire, and McCoy playing Walton Winkle, a Walt Disney type figure who owned an enormous theme park and was frozen while terminally ill in the hope of finding a cure in the future. So I do understand why some people might be disappointed in this if they were expecting the 5th, 6th and 7th Doctors to team up with the 8th to help him fight the anti-time virus and defeat Zagreus once and for all. And if we did get that, I dare say I would have really enjoyed it, but I actually think what we ended up with is far more interesting. With three 75 minute episodes, Zagreus is sprawling and covers a hell of a lot of ground, giving each Doctor something interesting and different to do. And lest we forget, McGann also kind of has a dual role in that for most of it, he's playing Zagreus, or at least a Doctor that doesn't know whether he's the Doctor or Zagreus. And it also brings in a lot of former companions as well as um, holographic projections doing all manner of different things. Charlie finds herself moving from projection to projection with the aid of the TARDIS, who has manifested in a form it thinks she'll trust, the Brigadier and created these projections in order to gain information to save the Doctor. So Nicholas Courtney and India Fisher have a lot of fun as they travel to uh, an airbase in the 1950s to encounter an experiment the Reverend Matthew Townsend is involved in, to historic Gallifrey during the time of Rassilon, um, to encounter a plot to assassinate him, and to wink his wonderland at the end of the universe where the man himself has yet to be revived and the animatronic animals have run amok and are fighting a war. This might all sound really disconnected, but the pieces actually fit together quite well across the course of three movie-length episodes, which then also provide a twist, a genuine twist, which makes you feel like hope is completely lost for Charlie. There's a return visit to the Death Zone, as Charlie and Townsend and Tepish and Winky all join forces to try and save the Doctor for becoming Rassilon's prisoner, and it's actually really affecting quite how beaten the Doctor gets in this. Paul McGann pulls no punches in his performance as an utterly broken man. And when Tepesh and 
Winky and Townsend, the uh, McCoy, Davison and, and, and Colin Baker, when they all rally around him to try and convince him that he is the Doctor, it's really effective. It's not quite Doctor Who in that they're playing different characters and they're trying to convince a Doctor who doesn't know he's the Doctor that he is the Doctor. And this discombobulation runs through Zagreus like a stick of rock and it might be one of the reasons why it isn't very highly thought of, but I have to admit, I think it's great. It might be too long, sure, but it's scope, it's ambition, it's audacity, are all things I really enjoy. We've got Sophie Aldred as a giant anthropomorphic duck, for goodness sake. It's bananas, but it commits, and it never loses sight of how big the story it's telling is. And with McGann actually solely credited as Zagreus, and Davison as Townsend, and Colin as Tepesh, and uh, McCoy as Walter Winkle, it's actually rather nice that the only former Doctor who seems to actually be credited as the Doctor is John Pertwee. Obviously it's made and released posthumously, but snatches of dialogue from the fan film Devious that Pertwee had uh, um, contributed to uh, is used. And they're treated a little bit too much that it's kind of hard to make out what he's saying, but the fact that his presence is there uh, and is there to guide the Eighth Doctor into remembering his true self is just a really lovely idea. You just gotta squint your ears really hard. Zagreus absolutely refuses to do what's expected of it, so naturally it pisses people off, but not me, I really like it. We're unlikely to ever get a story like this again. And this was made when Doctor Who wasn't a concern on TV, so Big Finish didn't have to necessarily adhere to the restrictions of its TV cousin, which these days rightly takes precedence. So Zagreus so pushes at those limits and it breaks some of them in the process. And it's a really odd, unique piece of work that I'm very glad exists. The sheer imagination on show is coupled with palpable personal drama in a story which includes so many out there ideas, not least Charlie and the 5th, 6th and 7th Doctors who happened to be other people at the time, riding on the back of a Jabberwock to get to the Dark Tower in Gallifrey's Death Zone. This is a hugely different approach from the conventional anniversary special while still cramming in an awful lot of Doctor Who legacy as celebration and I can only hope the 60th, another anniversary which doesn't look to be going the usual route, has a similar result. I know the day of the Doctor was huge, drawing probably Doctor Who's greatest ever audience with the global simulcast, but my actual living memories of the 50th 10 years ago still seem to pale in comparison when I look at materials chronicling the 20th anniversary. While Doctor Who had already begun referencing its past by this point, the spectacle of having previous Doctors back had only happened once before, so to have five of them must have been awe-inspiring. Okay, so we don't actually get five in the end, we get three some archive footage and a recast, but it still ends up feeling like the birthday party is the birthday party Doctor Who has ever thrown. A shopping list of disparate ingredients from clashing eras of the show, all knitted together seamlessly by Uncle Terence Dix. It's not a complicated plot, it's not even a complicated structure, everything here is simple. But that's its genius, I think. He has made it look simple, when in fact you've got five Doctors, Ten, I think, companions, the Master, Daleks, Cybermen, Yeti, Time Lords, Gallifrey, Rassilon, and even a new menace in the Raston Warrior Robot. It is full to the brim with sugary Doctor Who goodness and still coherently gets you from A to B to C, all with some brilliant Doctor Doctor banter. The third Doctor gets to meet the Cybermen after they were absent from his era, which is lovely. Susan gets to see her grandfather again, and Davison's playing over the scene when he sees her again is something really quite special. The second Doctor and the Brigadier make for an excellent double act. This is probably the most fun of all of the Doctor Who anniversary specials. And the actual lightweight nature of the nuts and bolts of the plot end up not being as important as a good time. The first Doctor and the Master's easiest pie scene makes no sense. Sarah Jane's tumble down the slope is laughable and Barusa is not that impactful a villain. But none of that actually matters. There's too much good stuff here elsewhere. Janet Fielding is at her best. Anthony Ainley also puts in, I think, his best performance as the Master. And because Trenton and Pertwee are doing their very best to walk away with the whole thing, everyone seems to be bringing their A-games. And throughout it all, Davison never feels like he's losing his own show. Of course, he's gracious enough to share the screen with his predecessors, but he still most definitely feels like THE Doctor here. And, I should add, so does Richard Herndl. If you're following my marathon, then you know full well that I'm a big old fan of Hartnell. And it's a shame he isn't here. But Herndl, though obviously no Hartnell, still doesn't embarrass himself by any means. If you squint a bit and you revel in the fact that it's the real Troughton and the real Pertwee, 
you can still kind of believe that he's the first Doctor. And you don't even massively miss the fourth. As with Silver Nemesis and the other TV stories on this list, I'll have more to say when their turns come on my marathon. But just to say that The Five Doctors, well, it's not without its hiccups and its problems. It's still one hell of a party, and that's why it earns a very respectable third place on this list. So with two places left, which one's going to come out on top? Doctors meeting each other is always cute, it's always fun, but it used to be mind-blowing. I guess the more something happens, the sheen naturally wears off, but with the three Doctors setting the precedent, it has the enormous status of being the first time it happened. William Hartnell, Patrick Trayton, John Pertwee in the same story. Phenomenal. The idea of it boggled my tiny little mind. When I had my first tiny glimpse of this story, when I sat down to watch the 30th anniversary documentary 30 Years in the TARDIS and they played a clip of the dandy in a clown scene. I was so aghast at seeing all these three talking to each other that I was sure it couldn't be a proper episode. This isn't, this, to me, this wasn't how Doctor Who had worked before. It didn't seem right, it didn't seem real. Then when I found out it was a Pertwee story proper, I almost couldn't believe it. The idea was so out there to me that I couldn't quite comprehend that the show would attempt it. And in the story itself, a lot is made of the fact, and we're told and told and told and told, that the uh, situation is so dire and it's such a dire emergency, that's the only reason the Time Lords are even orchestrating this, but we're not especially made to feel it. So it therefore just does feel like an excuse to arrive at the initial idea of the Doctors meeting each other. Which is what it is, of course. But so what if the story's a little bit flimsy? It's all such a sugar rush that the plot kind of takes a back seat anyway. And I mean, Omunga makes enough of an impression that he's endured as a large presence in Time Lord backstory and therefore the show's legacy. And the regulars don't get forgotten about either, like the Brigadier and Sergeant Benton. Although it does kind of feel like the Brigadier's character is heightened a little bit to be more buffoonish and comical, but Nicholas Courtney makes all of that so entertaining anyway that it's not too big an obstacle. And it all kind of plays into this being a self-indulgent shindig, something that the show has most definitely earned after 10 years. While we also get the returns of William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton, John Pertwee still emerges as the one in ownership of the show. Thanks in part to an excellently calibrated performance from Troughton, he isn't slacking, far from it, but there's a deference to Pertwee throughout, even when he's being cheeky and undermining him. It's interesting to me that if Pertwee and Troughton hadn't adopted this chemistry, the germ of which admittedly is in the script, because even Hartnell gets in on the bickering with the dandy and a clown, then would it, have, would it be considered the default when doctors meet? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Pro probably, I don't know. The thing is, is that whenever the show attempted a Doctor, a Doctor Doctor meeting, whether it was in the Three Doctors or much, much later, we probably will have ended up there anyway because the dynamic is so much fun. Yeah, it's a shame that Hartnell's health prevented him from a more extensive involvement in proceedings, but the fact is, he is here. We get to see the first Doctor again, as played by William Hartnell. And that counts for something. And being trapped as he is in the time, Eddie, affords him a kind of, like, other status, slightly removed and ethereal, and I've always found that quite appropriate for him. I mean, obviously having him stand alongside Pertwee and Troughton in the Antimatter universe would have been absolutely fantastic, so I'm not saying that I prefer it this way, I'm just saying that it's nice to have him back in whatever capacity, and this will always be his final performance, and that, that means it's special. So as an anniversary celebration, okay, yeah, it's a year too early, but it's a good way to kick off Doctor Who's 10th year. Actually, actually, scratch that, it's a glorious way to kick off Doctor Who's 10th year. We've got the three Doctors so far coming together, bouncing off each other, and giving us a story that still feels a little bit impossible, and sets the precedent for how many of us feel or expect Doctor Who anniversaries to now be marked. That's not to say they have to be marked this way, just that it's extra special when they are. Is this a cliché to have it at the top? Maybe, but what I find so impressive about the Day of the Doctor is that your mileage may vary. It's the most streamlined and effective script of all the big birthdays. The Five Doctors is impressive for everything Terence Dicks managed to cram in and make feel fairly germane to a simple A to B story, but I think the Day of the Doctor has an extra layer. An examination into the character of the Doctor, which is as much of a celebration of the show as having three Doctors bantering. The latter is true here as well, even if one of them is a new Doctor, but what a coup getting John Hurt to play the Doctor. It's a testament to how popular and successful the show have become by this point. I know that some are upset that it was at the expense of Paul McGann or any of the other Doctors, but 
I find the concept of the War Doctor really interesting. And on top of that, we get Oscar-nominated acting royalty to play him. The presence of the War Doctor acts as a kind of gestalt conduit for the classic series to pass comment on the new series, and in that regard, I think it really works. The story that this episode ended up being, I don't think would work quite as well had Paul McGann's Doctor been there instead, and I say that as someone who has Paul as one of his favourite Doctors. And I also struggle to see how it would work with any of the other Doctors instead of the War Doctor. Yeah, okay, the Zygon thread might sort of peter out to the point where it had to be resolved in a later story, but that's really the only niggle with the script. And even then, when you're in the mix of it, it's not really that noticeable. As with Troughton in The Three Doctors, Tennant is very careful to defer to the current Doctor, and I think that really works. And it showed me at the time just how bloody good Matt Smith is, that he can hold his own in scenes alongside established actors like Tennant, and especially Hurt, and in some cases, walk away with the whole scene. The Day of the Doctor is as much a sugar rush as the three or five Doctors, but it's also got a stronger story at its heart than either of those. It makes some choices that absolutely delight me. You've got the original opening titles, um, the point of view being skillfully skewed a little bit, so that in some stretches the War Doctor is the current Doctor seeing his future rather than being a past interloper and therefore giving him legitimacy. That's such a fantastic example of sleight of hand on Moffat's part, and that's not to mention the saving of Gallifrey as a climax and the reveal of Tom as the curator. All of them had me applauding. It doesn't let up for its 77 minutes, and in my opinion, more than rises to the challenge at celebrating 50 years of Doctor Who. And that's why it's at the top of this list. It's a cracking story, it's got amazing fan service, and the 50th anniversary was an enormous pressure to get right and this story succeeds in spades. Whether it's a cliche or not, it's my favourite of the anniversary specials. And now we wait for the 60th. In this list there's been an array of different types of stories, all of which have celebrated an anniversary in one way or another. And there are no set rules to Doctor Who, nor should there be, and it's always broken the ones it wanted to anyway. So there's no reason why the 60th anniversary should be a multi-Doctor adventure. As long as it celebrates the past respectfully, then all should be well. Making this list has helped ease some of my concerns, but it hasn't completely expunged them. My worries for the 60th were never actually that I just wanted a Doctor Fest, more a sneaking unease that it could just be a victory lap for Series 4 above all else. I obviously hope I'm wrong, but discussing the anniversaries of the past has sort of like helped make me a little bit more excited than I was for the 60th anniversary and I'll take that as a result. As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed my little birthday party, please do give it a like. It really does help the channel out enormously. And what are your thoughts? Is your ranking similar to mine? Have you experienced all of the stories on the list? Is it madness to like Zagreus this much? Is it insanity to have the Day of the Doctor above the Five Doctors? And is dissing Dimensions in Time this much going to have you sending people round to my house? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you back here for my Planet of Giants review as the marathon hits season two. And if you don't want to miss that, hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and I will see you soon.